After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Amen. Okay, children. Children's time. Our God and our Father, we come before you in prayer this morning uh, and we come in the name of Jesus. He is our great high priest and we come with robes of righteousness and royal robes, robes we don't deserve but that have been given to us by Jesus himself and he at the cross took our filthy rags in exchange. Uh, he uh, bore our sin what uh, we, we cannot ever uh, plumb the depths of the, um, uh, the, 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 the greatness of what he did, but he did. He, he on that cross, he died. Uh, as the hymnist said, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. And the only right response, hallelujah, praise the Lord. What a saviour. And it is in the name of Jesus we meet this morning, O oh God, and we want the name of Jesus to be lifted up amongst us. We understand that if Jesus is lifted up, then he will draw all people to himself. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that um, we have this opportunity this morning. It's still a day of opportunity, still a day of grace. And we praise you and we thank you that we have this privilege now of coming before you and worshipping you. And our God and our Father, we ask that you would meet with us this morning. Uh, without you, Lord, uh, there's, uh, there's, in a sense, there's no point. Uh, we, we, we're not content uh, just to have some words being uh, uttered from the front. We're not just content to go through the motions, as it were. Even as we heard last Sunday evening, to, to know your manifest presence by your spirit. You are always here because you are all present, and yet the, your manifest presence, that known and felt presence. And so we pray, oh God, please, by your spirit, make yourself known to us, speak to us this morning, oh God, and we would ask then that we would have listening ears, that we would not just... Ignore, we would not just not listen, but that we would receive you this morning. We pray especially then in this room for any 
who as yet uh, haven't come to the cross. There may be some here this morning who, as it were, are on the threshold, and yet that's not close enough to actually come to you in faith, O oh God. We pray that, that would, uh, you'd be pleased to visit us in saving faith this morning. We pray, O oh Lord, for the situation in Israel. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we just commit that situation into your hands. We thank you that we can understand and learn more about it, and we can understand with uh, biblical eyes, as it were, and understand that you ultimately are in, in control of all things, and you have your plans and purposes that will come to pass. But we pray, Lord, for those who are suffering. We uh, ask, O oh Lord, that you would meet with them. And uh, we recognize, O oh Lord, that there is so much suffering in this world. And we see, we see the reality of it, Lord. And we realize that it is because that sin has come into this world. That you, O oh Lord, when you created this world, it was good. And yet sin has come in and, and death through sin. And we mourn over that reality. And yet, Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a way of escape. There is a way of salvation. There is a way of rescue, a way of reconciliation with you, O oh God. A reconciliation with you and a salvation from sin. And we thank you it's through Jesus and only through Jesus. And so once again, Lord, we just pray that you would, uh, you would help us to hear and understand uh, these truths this morning. Uh, we pray for the meetings uh, that are coming up this week. Lord, even this last week, we want to give you thanks and we want to give you praise. Uh, you, Lord, uh, in you we live, we move, we have our being. And we thank you, O oh Lord, then, that we can give you praise for all that is past. But Lord, we trust you now for all that is to come. We commit this week into your hands. We think of our, the different uh, needs uh, in this church and those that we know, Lord, we thank you that we can commit and commend everyone into your hands. And uh, we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, continue with us by your grace. And we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, this church would go from strength to strength, would be built up. And that, Lord, it would be a light in this town. And that as a light, it would be a beacon. And it would warn of the wrath to come. But it would also be that uh, light that would show the way of salvation, that there is hope in this world that is so full of despair. And we pray, O oh Lord, that that hope which does not disappoint would indeed, Lord, be we would be filled with, even this morning, that we might know that joy unspeakable, full of glory. Oh God, our Father, we just bless, we praise your holy name. You are God, and there is no other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing then. Uh, it's an old one, but it's, uh, it's really a prayer, I guess. I hear thy welcome voice, and uh, may it be true as we sing it. Let's stand to sing.
Amen. Okay, so uh, we're continuing to look at uh, John's uh, gospel, uh, John the Evangelist, and uh, we're going into chapter 5. And uh, these chapters are quite long chapters. Uh, They're quite involved. There's quite a few themes going on, uh, but there is a a sort of a general thread. And uh, just by way of context... um, John tells us that Jesus has gone to a feast. He doesn't tell us which feast. There's some debate over that. doesn't matter. But uh, it's interesting. Once you see it, you can't help but see it. He basically kind of uh, keeps saying about these feasts that keep cropping up. And uh, really, it's to tell us why Jesus is in Jerusalem. Remember uh, that uh, previously he was there for the Passover and he did miraculous signs and many were attracted to those signs But uh, he didn't entrust himself to them, remember end of chapter 2, because uh, he knew what was in their heart. And they they liked him for the signs, but it wasn't saving faith. They didn't believe on him in a saving manner. And then we've seen, haven't we? Uh, We saw it last week, notably, that um, it's one thing to see the signs, and the signs are there, and they are to be followed. But ultimately, it's another thing altogether to actually get to the destination that those signs point to. And uh, we've already had hints in the gospel that there will be those who just won't only not recognize the signs, there will be those who are uh, in opposition to the one the signs are pointing to. And um, we know as well that uh, Jesus understands his mission And he is absolutely focused upon that mission, which is why he wouldn't allow people to uh, uh, to kind of make him a kind of uh, a political figure. Uh, And he would then go from the places where that would happen, and he would go to the places then where he could minister until his time had come. So the reason he's in Jerusalem. It isn't so that he can be made a king, as it were. It's because there's a feast of the Jews. And he still kept uh, the, the, the old covenant uh, uh, sort of uh, rituals, if you will. Uh, remember, they all point to him. He's the fulfillment of them. Uh, but he, he was obedient in these things at this point in time. And uh, he's there. And we're given some information about uh, this uh, sheep gate and, and, and the geography of it, we don't need to go into it, but basically uh, it seems probably where the entrance, <laughs> where sheep would have gone past, so probably a pretty uh, sort of um, out of the way area where all the, the people with illnesses gathered. And um, if you have uh, maybe an NIV or an ESV translation in front of you, you'll find that 3b, uh, verse 3b and 4 are missing. Now, it's not to take your Bible back to whom you bought it from and ask for a refund because there's bits missing. It's simply that uh, some manuscripts don't have verses 3b and 4 uh, in it. Is that something to get worried about? No, not at all. Does that affect the infallibility of Scripture? No, not at all. We haven't time to go into it, but it's, uh, if we were in Wales, we would say dim stress boil. Don't worry, Okay. Uh, But what we do find, and it's a strange, we have to admit, isn't it? It's a strange occurrence, but we find that uh, 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 these these, these pools, which were maybe um, kind of filled by springs, but these pools, uh, it says in verse 4, that an angel would come sporadically and stir the water, and the first person into the water would be healed. Now, what do we make of that? That is totally alien to our situation, isn't it? Well, all we can say is, <laughs> you can't put God in a box. Now, that's actually a really important lesson because in this day and age, even in the church, where we tend to have, have everything just so, we tend to almost put God in a box. Now, in the evenings, we're learning about the attributes of God. And what we learn, uh, we'll be learning week by week is that God cannot be contained. He is God. And uh, if he ordains that an angel would come down sporadically at a a place to stir the waters for people to be well. So be it. They needed it at that time. They didn't have an NHS. They were afflicted by illnesses. Their life expectancy 
uh, was not so good, the, the quality of life, so on and so forth. And what we find through this and throughout this, and indeed throughout the Gospels, is God is compassionate. You know, he is, uh, it is because of his mercy we are not consumed. Uh, we oftentimes look at it the wrong way. You know, even on, in terms of, you know, why does God allow this? You know, the fact is, why does God stay, his, why does God stay so much evil? How good God is in his common grace to people. How kind God is every day. Every day. And we don't even acknowledge it. We don't even give, give thanks for it. We should give thanks. We give thanks for our fruit. I hope you give thanks for everything you, you, you eat. For your medicine. All these things, you see, which we take so much for granted. God, ultimately, is the giver of all good things. And he's to be praised for that. So we have this sort of slightly alien situation where there's loads in verse 3, a great multitude. There's loads of people with all different illnesses, all different uh, problems. And they're all there because it's the kind of place to gather and they're hoping that they can get into the pool. And uh, out of all these many, many people, Jesus speaks to a a man, and uh, he learns that he's been there, Thir uh, he's not been there 38 years, he's had his paralysis for 38 years, so this isn't just a kind of um, passing thing, this isn't one of those aches where you've strained a muscle and give it a week or two, you'll be right again, this man has been in this situation for 38 years. And uh, wh why is it important? It's important because it shows the, the, uh, his, if you will, his impotence. Compared to God's omnipotence, Jesus' omnipotence, which we'll see later, this man is just helpless and hopeless. And that's important. So the first point I want to make uh, about this is, is that uh, this man has a need of healing. Okay, he's there at the place where there's a hope of maybe being healed. Why is he there? Because he has this need of healing and he's, he's been in this condition for 38 years. So he, he needs healing and there's many there as well who need it also. A great multitude and they're desperate. They know they need healing. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to look at this and then we're going, to, um, we're going to apply it step by step. So in terms of application then, this morning, friends, let me ask you, do you know your need of healing? Now, it may be some of us here have um, chronic pain. It may be some of us here have cancer. It may be some of us here have uh, less serious complaints. But I'm not talking really about physical I'm talking about spiritual, spiritual healing. Are you aware this morning of your need of spiritual healing? You see, the Bible tells us that through one man, death came into the world, sin came into the world. Historically, Adam and Eve were the first people on this earth. God created them. Adam was created with age, and then from Adam's rib, Eve came. The Bible doesn't present that as an allegory, a picture. The Bible presents that as historical fact. And they were made good. There was no sickness with Adam and Eve. That's alien to us. No colds, no seasonal flu. They, there was no illness whatsoever. But God gave them a choice. You can eat of all the different tr uh, fruit. I provide plenty and abundance for you. But the fruit of one tree you must not eat of. Why did God do that? Because God is God. We can't put him in a box. And it's to the, 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 the sadness, the tragedy of it, is that even though Adam and Eve walked with God and fellowshiped with God, even though they had 
everything their hearts could desire, yet someone, Satan in the form of the serpent, tempted them and said, actually, have you got everything your heart desires? Because do you not want to be like God? And he uh, tempted them and lied to them. When God said, if you eat of this fruit, you will die, and gave clear warning and spoke the truth, Satan came along and said, surely you will not die. And to the eternal regret of humanity, Adam and Eve listened to the snake rather than their maker. And they ate of that fruit, and at that moment, because of their disobedience, sin came in. And this barrier between man and God was formed. Because God cannot look upon sin. God cannot fellowship with sinners. Sin is, a, I think it's the holiness of God tonight, and we'll hear about it. But, but God cannot. He's pure. He's too pure. And so as a result, then, Adam and Eve are banished, and sickness, and illness, and suffering, and sadness enter into the experience of the human race. That's why there's suffering, and illness, and sadness, and sickness. And yet God in his mercy ultimately provides a rescue. And it just so happens it's this person we're looking at this morning, Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you, do you realize your need of healing? Physically there's maladies, there's difficulties, uh, mentally maybe, and those can be debilitating and very, very difficult. But there's one thing more urgent with you, a spiritual sickness. In fact, worse than a spiritual sickness, a spiritual death. Because when sin came in, this, the spiritual side of man uh, died. There's no fellowship with God now. Sin has come and, and killed that. And that's hereditary. So that we're born sinners. We're not born neutral. We're born sinners. We're born slaves to sin. We're not born free people. We're born slaves to sin. And in that condition, we are spiritually dead. So that actually, without any intervention, we would be under the wrath of God, and we would continue for God's wrath to abide on us. And when death would come, inevitably, at that point, then we would enter into eternity of spiritual death, into an eternity of God's wrath abiding upon us. And that's our default position. So this morning, friends, what I want to get across to you is that each of us here needs healing. There's nobody in this room who cannot say, I don't need healing. Maybe it is you've come to Jesus already and you can say, I've been healed, praise God. But if that's not the case, then you absolutely do need healing. Well, this man, let's get back to this man. He knew that he needed healing. And uh, this, uh, this question uh, that comes through. And it is such a direct question. Uh, we read it, don't we? Uh, in verse 6. Do you want to get well? It's a direct question, isn't it? Do you want to get well? And, you know, it's hard. Or do you want to be made well? Or do you want to be healed? But this direct question, and just think about it now for a moment. Jesus is there, there's this crowd of people, and uh, he, uh, he comes to this man, he learns that he's been there 38 years, uh, not been there 38 years, he had this infirmity, infirmity 38 years, and he says to him, do you want to get well? Now, you could almost think, is this a cruel question? Because of course he wanted to get well. But we need to think, about: is Jesus cruel? No, he's not cruel at all. What he's getting him to is, actually, do you know, have you, do you really want to get well? Or uh, are you just 
in that kind of position where you're sort of, you've become resigned to your condition. You've become resigned to the fact that you will never get well. So it's a simple, direct question. And you know, it's interesting, isn't it? We have the backstory because we have Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman when he says, could I have a drink? And she says, uh, and he said, if you knew what I could offer you. You know, we know that Jesus is able to heal. We already know, don't we? This fellow doesn't know, but we already know that Jesus is able to heal. You know, and the glorious thing this morning, friends, is uh, if it is this morning that you, you know you need healing, you know that actually uh, you're, you cannot say, uh, I am in a relationship with God. You can't say that. And if you can't say that, you know that you're in this default position. The default settings of humanity is outside of a relationship with God, aliens from God, under judgment of God. So if you cannot say, I'm in a relationship with God, then okay, I understand that. That's my place. And uh, you know, uh, maybe it is, even in your experience, uh, you know that there's something more to life. There must be something more to life. Maybe it is you've begun to think about the, 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 the great questions. You know, where have we come from? Where are we going? What's the point of all of this? Maybe it is that uh, you've had those thoughts, uh, you know. Well, the glorious reality, friends, this morning is, is that Jesus asking this question, he's the one to ask it. You know, because he's got the power to do something about it. This is what comes through. You see, uh, what is the man's response to that question? You know, do you want to be made well? Do you want to get well? And and the man's response is this. Well, I I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Uh, While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, it's interesting because different people will understand different things from this. Am I saying that the Bible speaks in different ways? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, on the one hand, we're sympathetic with this man, aren't we? Who can't be sympathetic? This poor fellow has, has had this crippling condition for 38 years. And even now, when he's on the kind of threshold of being in that pool, but it seems that all the time that the angel stirs the waters, somebody else gets ahead because they've got someone to help them in, and he hasn't. And on the one hand, you feel, well, you feel very sympathetic. But, you know, on the other hand, it can be read slightly differently. On the other hand, this man is, is, he, is, he, is he wallowing in his self-pity? You know, uh, excuses, well, I, there's no one to help me. Is this man a little bit grumpy? Is this man a little bit self-piteous? Maybe you think I'm being hard, but, but it's interesting, isn't it? He, he doesn't just say, yes, I want to get well. He says, but I can't. And he gives his excuses, you know, on one hand, or maybe it's a legitimate reason. On the other hand... It's just an excuse. Well, the same question to us this morning, friends. Do you want to get well? Let me put it in another phrase. Do you want to be a Christian this morning? And you know, the glorious thing here is that there will be people with different reasons for not being a Christian this morning. Or... If we were to put it in a different way, there will be people here with different excuses as to why they won't become a Christian. But let's think of the sympathetic ones. There's a person, they say, well, look, I'd love to be a Christian, but all my family, they would disown me. We have sympathy with that, because what you've realized is that there's a cost. There's a cost to becoming a Christian. There's a cost to truly following Jesus. And it will be a great cost. It will be a cost that perhaps many others in this room won't have to bear. Because perhaps many others have come from families where Jesus isn't opposed. But for some, to become a Christian, it will mean that not only will their family disown them, but for some in this room maybe, their family will want to kill them. Is that going too far? No, no. The reason that many are coming into this country is for exactly that reason. Okay, what about those people then who have family members who are Christians? What a privilege. On the one hand. But what do you do with someone who's saying that they're a Christian? A mum, a dad, a spouse, a sibling. But then in their lives are not showing Christ. That can be a massive stumbling block. 
I want to become a Christian, but I'm looking at these people in my family and I don't want to be like that because when I hear Christianity from the Bible being preached about, I want that. But when I see it in practice, there seems to be so much hypocrisy and I would rather have nothing to do with it than be a hypocrite because as I understand it, the hypocrisy is the thing that really gets God angry. We can sympathize with that. How many people have been, you know, Spurgeon said that the, 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 um, those outside of the church have done great harm to the church, great opposition, but not half as much as those inside. Somebody's bad witness, somebody's carelessness, somebody's kind of uh, poor Christianity can have a massive impact on those around them. Or maybe it is the opposite. Maybe it is. You've got people in your family who are, who are out and out lovers of Jesus. And you look at their lives and you see them and you see them, how they deal and you can't maybe put it into words, but perhaps this word grace, that seems to be banded around. Maybe you begin to understand that it's Jesus is, is filling their hearts with love. And they're able to uh, keep a balance in the most tempestuous of situations. There's the person who has that physical illness, and yet there's joy in their lives. There's the person who has that troublesome spouse, because of that person's Christianity, and yet there's, there's a, a sanctifying effect on the whole household. There's the single Christian, in the, ho- the, the one Christian in the whole household, and yet that one Christian keeps their witness. They're consistent, they're constant. They show that through and through they really love Jesus. Maybe for you, you think, I can't do that. I couldn't do that. I'm not like them. I haven't got what they've got. And we could go on. Maybe it is you're kind of, uh, you're thinking it through and you're thinking, I've got to get all my ducks in a row. If I'm going to be a Christian, I want to make sure that I, I understand this. You know, do I believe it? Yes, I believe it, but, I, but there's things I don't understand. And I want to get these things right. Because I, I don't want to just enter into Christianity kind of, you know, I, I ask Christians certain questions. Maybe it is. You're one of those that you've asked Christians certain questions. You realize, well, they don't, they don't know all the answers. And, and maybe actually some who think they know all the answers. And then when you've asked them a question, they've, they've given a political answer in as much as they've not answered the question. They've, they've skirted around it. They've are, but, you know, may, maybe it's, you know, and that becomes a hindrance because you think, well, if you don't know the answer, are you just following this blindly? Are you just ignoring the, 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 the knotty issues that this, this word can present? You know, there's some verses missing from that translation. Uh, now, you see, I need to understand this. I need to get this square in my head before I can possibly become a Christian because I don't want to be like those people who who just say they know Jesus, but then you scratch a bit deeper, and their knowledge of this is pretty, pretty weak. My mates, the people I, the circles I'm mixing, my self-respect, I would get eaten alive if I said, I know, I, I've become a Christian. And then when they asked me some of these contradictions, seemingly, and I wasn't able to answer, well, no, I need to, I need to, I need to be sure of my ground before I become a Christian. Or maybe it is there's some here who are, who are kind of waiting for a stirring. You know, whoa, hang on a minute, you've just said, you've just come out with it. Do you want to be healed? I've got to feel it. I've got to wait for that feeling because I hear people's testimonies. Or maybe how sometimes it's been introduced, or or maybe it just is 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 that you know it, maybe it is you you picture it as this big leap, and uh, I need a run up, 
And maybe it is, you know, I, I'm a bit nervous and do I run now? No, 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 I'll, no, not yet, not yet. I'll come back next Sunday. Do I run now? No, 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 I need to, I need to hear a bit more. I, I, now's not the time and, and uh, I'm going on holiday soon and I'll miss church and then I might just slip again. So no, 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 and, and uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I need to get, deal with some sins first in my life before I can really, you know, have the weight off to really run and then leap and, and, and then Jesus will catch me. But I've got to make sure I can get us, I'm training for the, for the spiritual long jump in order to get to heaven. Maybe that's your thinking. So you're thinking you've got, what have you, you're, you're focusing on what, what can I do? What have I got to do? What do I need to do first? What are the things? And maybe it is because of your personality, your temperament or whatever it is, you have a kind of a checklist of things. Or maybe you're just plain scared because this is an unknown. Because actually the more you think about it, the more you're going to leap. It's a leap into the unknown. And you think about your life. And maybe you think about your wife. And maybe you think about your friends and your family. And you just think, well, this, as this is presented, this is, this is, this is real. And this isn't just on a Sunday. This is going to be transformational. And I just, I just need time to think about it. Lots of different reasons, you see. But let me just say, all of those reasons, maybe we have sympathy with some, maybe we would just say they're excuses. But all of those reasons actually are irrelevant to the question that Jesus is asking. You see, Jesus didn't ask this man, why haven't you been healed? He didn't ask him, why haven't you got yourself into that pool, man? He says, do you want to be healed? And this morning, this is the, this is the wonder of it, friends. You can leave all your concerns, all your bags, baggage, all your excuses, or all your reasons, all your difficulties, all your hindrances, you can leave them at the door. And just as we will have come this morning from many different directions, I don't think anybody will have come from the sea, but you never know, but just as we will have come from many different directions, but we've come in through the one door. This morning there will be people who have come from many different directions, their contexts in their life, there's many different directions and contexts and all the rest of it. But you know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> There's one door. Jesus is the door, as we'll find out later in the gospel. So there he, it's, all our reasons, all our excuses are irrelevant to the actual question that Jesus is asking. So let's go one more time. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be a Christian this morning? That's the question that's being asked. Do you want to be? And actually, it's a yes, no question. It's a yes, no answer. And it may be this morning you don't. Because you don't believe it. Or because you'll love your life as it is. In which case, the Bible says, not me, the Bible says that you are foolish. I mean that really gently, really carefully. I don't mean to be offensive. But you know, the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What's our lifespan? 70 years, 80 years? What's that in the context of eternity? And what is this life? Is this it? Fill your boots? On what? Pick and mix? You soon feel sick. The things of this world? Is that it? Is that all there is to life? 
Okay, we love to see little toddlers grow up and be cute and throw teddies at visitors and all the rest of it. We love that. But is that it? Is there nothing more? And by you saying to that answer, to that question, do you want to be a Christian? By saying no, what you're saying is, this is it. I'm settling for this. And the Bible just says, foolish. Because you're missing out. You're missing out on this. What's this? Well, the person who's asking the question this morning, Jesus himself, You're missing out on a relationship with him. You're missing out on being reconciled to God. You're missing out on all of the privileges that come with that. But you're missing out on the person. You're missing out on your one true love. You're missing out on him, the one who loves you so much and is faithful in all things and loyal and has shown his love for you that he has died. The Father who loves you so much and has demonstrated his love for you that he has sent his Son to die in your place. You're missing out, friends, on the very person who has made you and has created you. You're missing out on the one who wants to spend eternity with you. You're missing out on the one who is just good and goodness. You're missing out on the one who, when he created... It was good. It was very good. You're missing out on the one who is all-knowing, who knows all things, the one who is all-powerful, who can do all things, the one who sees all things, the one who has made a way possible that we can be reconciled to him and for all of eternity dwell with him in light, in beauty, in majesty, in purity, and there will be no impurities, no suffering, no sorrow, no sin, no sadness. You can understand why the Bible would call you a fool for saying no. What about those then who say yes? Yes. Okay, yes, I do want to be a Christian, but leave the buts. No buts. (laughs) Just answer the question. Do you want to be a Christian? Yes. Right. What did Jesus say to the man? Verse 8. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Simple as that. Get up. Do you want to be healed? Yes. Get up. Whoa, hang on a minute. It can't be as simple as that. But it was. Because who was asking the question? (laughs) Who was offering? That's implicit in that question. Who was offering to heal? Jesus, he's just healed the nobleman's son in the last chapter. And he did that from 16 miles away. This isn't too hard for Jesus, is it? Get up. Because what we find is, uh, at once the man was cured. Now, my insight into that, my thought into that is that this man didn't, No, he was cured and then got up. This man listens to Jesus and gets up. And we're given insight into the reason he's able to get up, because he was cured. But the point is, this man's interaction with Jesus, do you want to be healed? Ah, but, but, but. Do you want to be healed? Yes, get up. And the authority of Jesus, that voice, that voice that just has such authority, That voice has such comfort. That voice that just you have to listen to. The man gets up. And he picks up his mat. He's not doddering. He's able to pick up his mat. Which then later the people are going to call him out for. Which is another story. And we'll come to it maybe next week. But the point is this. The man who was completely not healed for 38 years. Is all of a sudden 
healed and healed fully. So do you want to be a Christian? Yes. Get up. Now, in some services, and perhaps if I had a bit more madness in me, there's enough there already, uh, <laughs> I'd say, right, those who want to be Christians, stand up. You know, there are, uh, there was, um, I was reading a, a missionary uh, story uh, behind the Iron Curtain in Russia. There were these Christians meeting in secret, and this fella in uniform came with a big Kalashnikov, I guess it was, it was a big gun anyway, and he says, any Christians, stand up. And a load of people got up and ran out. And then he came in, he put his gun down, he said, I said, I want to worship with real Christians. <laughs> you know, in other words, the ones who were fake had legged it. <laughs> the ones who were real Christians had stood there and, 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 and sort of, you know, and he wanted to be with real Christians. Now there is a place, sometimes there may be a place to say, you want to be a Christian? You need to get up. And partly that's why we have this baptistry here. Because being baptized, you can't hide that, can you? We don't do baptisms at home, yeah? Baptist, I don't think we do anyway, but the, the, the baptistry is open. It's a public, a public proclamation of your faith in Christ. And that takes some guts, doesn't it? But the point is this. Just get up. Let me illustrate it. Uh, Spurgeon, I've quoted him a lot, haven't I? But Spurgeon, he did this uh, really great children's talk, but probably unsustainable for financial reasons, where there was a load of uh, uh, children of the church and, uh, you know, they, they knew how to behave and they, they, they knew how to hold the knife and fork, probably. Uh, and then there was uh, a street child. And Spurgeon has this pocket watch that's gold. Gold-plated, I don't know, but expensive. And he says to these children... Does anybody want this? And all the very polite children, because they know that the mums and dads are watching, they don't ask for it. Because why on earth would somebody be giving a gold watch away? Of course it's a trick. Of course it would be impolite to just take it. And then the street child saw the gold watch. He wanted it. He got up, he took the fella at his word, who would like this, and he went and got it. And you can imagine all the other children looking as this little lad goes up and takes the watch. And it wasn't a trick. That little lad kept that gold watch. The only reason I've never done it is because I can't afford to give away a gold watch. Maybe when I've done 20 years in the ministry, you give me a gold watch. Maybe I'll do that illustration, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, the point is this. The little fella didn't think. He didn't overthink it. He knew what he wanted. And he believed the fella who offered it. It's like that for the, for the person. Now, do you want to be a Christian? Do you believe that Jesus is able to save you? He's able to save you. Even you, you think, but I've got all this baggage. I'm not being funny. Get in the queue. He's saved Saul of Tarsus. He can save anyone. In the Old Testament, he saved a fellow who sacrificed his children. Manasseh. He can save you. It doesn't matter how you've got here this morning. You're here. It doesn't matter what's brought you to this point spiritually. All those baggages, but you don't know what wrong I've done. You don't know about my family. You don't know about my situation. You don't know about my circumstances. It's all irrelevant to the question now being asked. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be a Christian? Yes. So get up. Take Jesus as his word. And we see what the man does. He responds. You know, there may be some here 
who've been at this stage before and they've bottled it. Let's, let's be frank, they've bottled it. Well, there may be some here who, you know, they've managed to convince themselves, they've managed to justify themselves, and they've managed to say, why not now? Well, if that's you, God has been so merciful to you because he spared you maybe this last time to hear this. And please hear this. Now is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Now. Now. Now is the day of salvation. Do you want to be healed? Then get up. Do you want to be healed? Go to Jesus. Do you want to be healed? Respond to him. It's far better than a gold watch. It's this beautiful gift of salvation. And it's not just a minister who's offering it. It's Jesus himself who you can take at his word. That's it. If you're looking for something else, if you're looking for a magic feeling, if you're looking for somebody to hold your hand, sorry. If you do want to be prayed with, happy to. The vestry, happy to. But listen, that's it. Do you want to be a Christian? Get up. Now. Not tomorrow. Now. And Jesus will cure you. Isn't it marvellous? By God's grace, I pray that some, even this morning, will leave all their excuses or reasons, or baggages, or difficulties, and they will just listen to Jesus' question and say, yes, I want to be healed. And they will know that healing power of Jesus. Amen. I've saved this one for the last because it's a difficult one to sing. In the first hymn, we'd be struggling, wouldn't we? But we've had a warm-up, so let's sing with our lungs bursting, crown him with many crowns. Thank you.